Hello my vamps and vagabonds. It is I, Artemisia. I am here, uh, I think, kind of making my first tag video. This is something called the Opera Goth Tag. Now, five years ago, I was a little baby bat who was also studying classical music and had no idea how to mix these two things together or I, I guess in my head these things couldn't be compatible or work together. I came across another YouTuber, I say another like I'm a YouTuber, but anyway, I digress. I come across this YouTuber named Adrienne LeVay of Lyje Resurrected on YouTube and she was another goth who studied classical singing. So naturally we bonded over that and together because the intention was for me to create this as well. Um, we created something called the Opera Goth Tag that was meant for darkly inclined classical singing inclined people on YouTube um, to fill out. So, um, I wouldn't say I'm really goth anymore. I, um, I, I don't regret being goth when I was 18. I'm 24 now. I love the fashion. I don't think I did it quite right. I, um, I love music. I got, I've been getting into the music quite a bit during the pandemic. More about that later. But I don't think aesthetic-wise, I would call myself a goth anymore, I say, as I wear a completely black outfit and have bright red hair. So, questions. Question number one. What keeps you going when stress from either community gets to you? So, I would say something that I came across a quote that I came across um, a while ago by Professor Elemental it was a steampunk chap hop artist. He said that once you really have your niche and you're established in it and you just go for that niche, uh, you're eventually going to attract people who will help you out with it. You're going to attract a community, a following. And more importantly, if you do what you love, you're going to explore your niche. So when I was 19, I don't think I ever would have guessed that being a darkly inclined dresser, being into um, Emily Autumn and circus contraption and goodness knows what else in terms of the devil's carnival the devil's carnival things like that i would have never thought things like that and classical singing would go together in any particular way so i wouldn't really call myself part of the goth community or part of the opera community anymore because what i have discovered my niche to be is dark cabaret. That is specifically 1920s and 1930s Weimar Berlin inspired dark cabaret. So here I have this lovely excuse to create costumes and pretend that I'm the ghost of a dead cabaret singer from Berlin. And I also get to use my acting training, my love, the theatrical, as well as my classical training in more classical lyric style songs. And of course, being a mezzo-soprano, one also gets to do all the dark witchy roles as well. So I'm looking forward to, um, I'm looking forward to being old enough to be Azucena and Dalila and all those other sorceresses and seductresses. On to the next question. What made life as both a goth and an opera singer a challenge for you? I think this is more in the beginning 
when I was when I was a teenager and was dressing goth. I think the biggest challenge was me thinking that I had to give up one or um, not letting the two mesh. Like I feel like I'm pretty meshed in a way. <laughs> Is there something you get crap for from both the opera and goth communities? That's question number three. Interesting. I would say nothing really in terms of the gothic community. Um, the opera community. Now that's interesting. Uh, the most negative thing I would say is family members who either back then or now think my performance style is too weird or I can't do opera if I dress like this. Um, that's it pretty much. Yeah. Fourth question. Habits you wish you could break. Is that the fourth one? Yes. Habits I wish I could break. Oh boy. too hard on myself. Now there's a big difference between having discernment and having a high expectation of yourself so that you can learn and grow and as many of us over the pandemic had to do, sort of be our own teacher and having that level of self-awareness is really important to sort of self-coach. But then there, it can become um, it can become self-deprecation it can become again being too hard on yourself I feel that I've gotten a lot better at that lately this comes with confidence in one's ability and just being at home in your technique but no one's perfect so I guess I would have to say that and internet shopping that's something else I should not do. Hopes for the future of goth and opera. Um, there's a few, I think. Uh, in terms of both of them together, goth and opera together, a bit unrelated sort of the sister genre of both, but I've always thought it would be cool for there to be a metal musical. There's been hip-hop musicals, there's been musicals modeled after pop and rock singings, there, singing, there's been jukebox musicals, but there hasn't been a metal one yet. I would imagine the pyrotechnics and the special effects to be really cool. The sort of archetypes that metal already taps into could be some really fabulous characters. I'm imagining some symphonic metal singer, um, like some kind of angel or demon descending from the top of the stage amidst a shower of sparks and sparklers coming from uh, a wire descending as she's singing. That would be really cool. Goth and opera together. I feel like people have already been exploring that. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a production of The Magic Flute set in 1920s Germany done in a silent film style. It was done primarily, there were no sets but everything was done with projections, platforms, and performers uh, against the screens. So I remember the very famous aria 
it was um, the soprano that was playing the queen of the night. She was standing on a platform and there was a projection that made her look like this creature, this enormous 30 foot creature with spider legs. Um, and it was all black and white and her daughter was running from her. Um, yeah, it was very interesting. There were some very interesting projections and I feel like that could be something that would count as fusing both artistic genres. What exercise do you do not vocal to help your voice technique? I do a lot of planking. I do a lot of boat poses. Sometimes I sing while I'm doing them. Um, that's really good for your uphold jaw. I am quite honestly constantly thinking about that sort of position that gets you to access the fullest extent of your lungs. So sometimes I'll catch myself just standing on the street or in my dance practice or even in my asana pra practice. I'm like, okay, tuck your tail, extend your spine, get that diaphragm, um, get that diaphragm under you and then I'll start to breathe better and I won't get any back injuries. So alignment. Uh, what else do I do? I guess the more that you think about that aligned spine, the head being in the proper place, the feet being in the proper place, the better your technique is. If you have an orthobionomist near you, an orthobionomist is sort of a therapist that puts your skeleton back into position. I've had a couple of sessions in Mine has worked wonders on the alignment of my skeleton. I'm also really into um, fascia work. The fascia is the sort of webby stuff that connects the musculatory system. It's all very elegant, the, um, the design of the human body, the machine of the human body. Most tragic composer biography that would make a good goth song. Very interesting. I have to think about this. Schubert. No, I'm sorry. Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky was gay and he had to be in a lavender marriage to a woman that fun funded his operas and his orchestral works. There was also a huge conspiracy about how he died. I'm not sure if it was confirmed or not, but he was pushed off or fell off of a bridge and drowned in a river. He wrote um, None But a Lonely Heart, I believe, was written as a sort of autobiographical song. And there's just so much tragedy in his music. Um, I'm a big fan of um, the Chasna Stal from The Maid of Orleans, which is when Joan of Arc is expressing her sorrow at having to leave uh, her homeland, having to leave her beloved forests and pastures and her lakes and all of the animals that she grew up with. So beautiful. Who would I love to perform alongside? Oh boy. Um... Love to perform I don't think anyone in particular. I'm such a solo artist and I love um, 
when I do perform with people, I have such a good time doing it. I just, whoever I perform with, it's already such a magical experience. Um, yeah. Dream Gothic Opera. Now, I'm not sure quite what that means. Is there an opera that I would love to see goth? Is is there a story I would love to be, I would love to see turned into a gothic opera? I guess I'll go with the first one. Is there an opera that I would love to see turned goth? Salome. Salome would be so good turned goth. Especially in that early 20th century silent film vamp way. I don't feel, I don't think that that's been done before. And what's the most goth opera I've ever seen? It's got to be that production of, um, not Die Fledermaus, Dead Zauberflotte. Definitely that one. Oh, favorite opera arias. So... I have so many. I've got to say, um, Da Chas Nostal is definitely one of my favorites. Also going to say anything from Carmen. Oh, there's a new one I've been working on called Re del Abiso from Un Ballo in Maschera by Verdi. I love anything Verdi because he writes songs that are nice and comfy for big, giant, heavy voices like mine. It's about, it's about this sorceress that's conjuring up all these spirits and um, elemental beings and there's people watching her and it's very intense. Um, she's like three times uh, the salamander doth cry, three times does the hoopoe bird cry out um, and yeah, it's, it's very intense. and very heavy and I love it. It's got some low G's and some high A's and it's very exciting. What composers inspire you? I have been in the 1920s for the past couple of months, so I'm going to say Misha Spolyansky for one. He, um, he was a Jewish composer then and he and a lot of other composers, a couple didn't make it, for obvious reasons. They had to leave Germany. He wrote what is considered to be one of the first queer anthems in history, the Lavender Song, and he wrote some really fantastic compositions for a bunch of different reviews, like Schall und Rauch, for instance. He wrote a really melodramatic, boozy, sultry, smoky, intoxicated waltz called Morphium that I feel like has a distinctively vampy flair. Which com which performers, living or dead, are you inspired by? Um, just want to give a big shout out to Le Pustra, who not only has been um, coaching me in German cabaret from the twenties and thirties, he's also a huge influence on my performance, if, if whoever's watching, if any of you ever get the chance to see the Kabarett de Nehmenlosen in Berlin, it's not up and running yet, so give money to their Patreon, do go see it, their videos are fantastic, and one day I would love to go. So I would say, um, I would say him, I would also say Emily Autumn, in terms of what boundaries as a classical musician can be pushed and how they can be pushed. Uh, Jill Tracy for channeling atmospheres and ambiance, spirits and spells through music. Um, she's also a big influence. Any silent films? I've been wa I've I've watched. Oh gosh, what's it called? It's got Anita Berber in it. I think 
Library. Watch later. It's called Un Unheimliche Geschichten, which I think means strange stories or uncanny stories. Um, I saw Metropolis working on the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. I'm working on Manon Lescaut with Mar Marlene Dietrich. Yeah, there's probably others, but I can't think of them. Dream rolls, oh boy. Um, let's start with opera. I'm only going to do opera because there's, of course, Shakespeare and musicals and uh, off-Broadway productions. I want to be Jenny from the Three Penny Opera. I feel like I would have a lot of fun with that. Or really, uh, any character, as long as it's a mezzo role. Carmen, I really want to be Carmen. I really want to be Ulrika. Azucena, Salome, hands down, Salome. She has this big dance scene uh, where she's uh, she's doing the dance of the seven veils and kind of invoking the the myth of Inanna Ishtar Astarte, where she's stripping off these seven veils. And it's I, I've seen belly dancing choreographies to it. I'm also a belly dancer, and it's my dream to be Salome and uh, do a belly dancing choreography to the Tanz der Sieben. What is it? Der Sieben Schleier. Yeah. That. There's others. What got you into opera? Um. My parents are both classical musicians. And I have childhood memories of my father singing all these arias. And using my brother and I as standards for other people on stage in the scene that he was rehearsing. I have memories of being backstage and babysat by the other singers. I have memories of being in rehearsal rooms and coloring or doing homework or whatever. I really don't think I could escape opera even if I wanted to. I tried taking a break or outright quitting, but just kept coming back to it. I I would also have to say that um, if you love something, you of course you do have to make sacrifices for it. But traditions are just traditions, and if you want to break the mold. Um, it's, it's not illegal. If you want to make your own artistic thing, go for it. Of course, honor the past, but create your own artistic persona as well. Um, do I have a funny story related to singing you'd like to share? So, back when I thought I was a soprano, uh, or specifically a coloratura soprano. I um, I was in like a community theater production of Candide uh, by uh, not Gershwin Bernstein. It's an operetta by Bernstein, and it's crazy and really hard to put on. And here I was, overworked dehydrated because not only was I doing the role of Kunigonda, I was helping make the costumes too because that's just what you do and that's just what I do because there's no business like show business. 
So I was overworked. My stomach was feeling queasy. And then, so I throw up before a couple of minutes before I go on. And pretty, pretty shortly into the opera, Kunaganda and Candy would have a lot of kissing scenes. So never told him. Yeah. Lastly, how does singing make you feel? <sighs> how does the sun make flowers grow? How does... How do poets write poetry? It's... I, I guess it would be easier for me to say, how does not singing make you feel? I get very depressed if I'm not able to perform or sing. It's really a part of me. It's as essential to me as eating or drinking or breathing. I need to be involved with some form of artistic creation or preparing for a show. Otherwise, life feels meaningless. Singing gives my life meaning. And so there you have it, folks. That was the goth opera tag. You're welcome. Goodbye.